Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, the weekly libertarian podcast from the magazine that is still accepting Webathon donations until midnight Tuesday. Go to reason.com slash donate. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Hi, gang. Webathon howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy Webathon Monday. We're going to get to a, a rare internal punishment of a corrupt elected American official here in a moment. Mm. But first, hey, folks, this is Spike Cohen, and I'm inviting you to join me next year in Washington, D.C. for Liberty Con. This flagship event by Students for Liberty is being hosted in D.C. the weekend of February the 2nd through the 4th at the Grand Hyatt. Join me and speakers and students from over 30 different countries in one place as we discuss the libertarian solutions that will shape our world and lead us to a freer future. We're going to feature panels, discussions, debates, and breakout sessions with featured guests like former Congress Justin Amash, Tuttle Twins author Connor Boyack, Whole Foods founder John Mackey, economist Deidre McCloskey and Brian Kaplan, independent journalist Ford Fisher, and many more incredible people. You'll hear from organizations such as Fee, Reason Magazine, and my organization, You Are the Power. We've even got a special secret guest speaker. Who is it? Well, there's only one way to find out. Join me at LibertyCon. Register right now at LibertyCon.com and be sure to use the promo code ROUNDTABLE to save 25% off your registration. And I'll see you at Liberty Con. Okay, so a weird thing happened on Friday. A sitting member of the House of Representatives was actually expelled from Congress for being a serial liar, abuser of power, and accused criminal. Uh, George Santos, who was part of the New York City commuter suburbs mini wave of blue state Republicans who tipped the House red in 2022, was booted on Friday by a vote of 300, it's hard to pronounce numbers, and 11 to 114 after which the puffy fabulist declared, quote, to hell with this place <laughs> 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 and threatened to file ethics complaints and dish dirt about a handful of now ex-colleagues, including Republicans. Thus endeth at least the congressional portion of Santos's weird career, which has included lies about being the grandson of Nazi persecuted cuted Jews and the son of a woman who died on 9-11, as well as formal charges that he lined his own pockets with campaign contributions and even his congressional colleagues' credit cards, using them for stuff like luxury vacations and Botox. Uh, Santos is now staring into the teeth of a 23-count federal indictment. Catherine, it is pretty rare for Congress folk to be expelled. Basically, you have to be a Confederate or a convict. And uh, George is neither. Are you comfortable with this seeming lowering of the bar? Uh, and if so, who's uh, next against the wall? I do not know whether, like, where even is the bar at this point? Like, what bar <laughs> are we lowering and how can it's it Suderman's get basement. Yeah, I think any the lower? The question is which bar we're going to. Yeah. Where is the bar? Which, where is the bar is, is the, the question the... I want to ask um, and not for limbo purposes. Yeah. Okay. So. My, uh, despite being not a big fan of voting for myself personally, I do love it when people vote against sitting congressmen. And I think that that is mostly the right mechanism here. I think we do this every two years with people in the House. That is a short time period. So for the most part, I am happy to just wait and let the electorate take care to sort of take out the garbage if the garbage needs taken out. Um, as you say, with the maybe very, very specific examples of like convicted of a crime or actual Nazi or whatever it is, I do want to associate myself, I think, with uh, the insightful analysis by Josh Barrow, who uh, wrote in his newsletter about this matter, it seems that you can be a gay Republican or you can be a messy bitch who lives for drama Republican, but being both at the same time remains a bridge too far for many conservatives. And while I am always, always, always hesitant to say, oh, he was discriminated against because uh, of a demographic category, it does seem manifestly true that there are plenty of messy bitches who live for drama still in their seats securely in the House and um, that maybe, maybe arguably uh, gay Republican is the identifier here or the distinguishing factor here. Although the counterexample, as Barrow notes, is Madison Cawthorn, who is at mm. least um, ostensibly straight and got booted as well. And there's also the stealing, <laughs> stealing your colleague's credit card. Yeah. And then like, I get, why, the they're, I get why they're mad. That's a little, yeah. I'm not sure that Matt Gates is doing that. 
uh, but, yet. I mean, Robert uh, Menendez is still there, right? So that's the counterexample. Also a little puffy. Nick. I think the, the uh, weight yes, factor exactly. is, you know, if uh, I think if mm -hmm. uh, Santos was a little buffer, this would uh, the vote wouldn't have happened. Nick, are there uh, lessons um, to be learned about how Congress ends up producing people like George Santos in the first place? Uh, well, it's the American voters and particularly of his congressional district who are responsible for him. You know, I, I didn't do anything. The American people, you nobody on this podcast did anything to produce George Santos. So, uh, you know, he's got to start yourself. looking, uh, you know, at the man in the mirror and then everybody who voted him in the Republican Party in upstate New York, et cetera. I find it uh, um, actually a, a, a to, uh, I guess, echo what Catherine was saying. Like, I find it uh, kicking somebody out short of an actual finding of a of a crime being broken or some kind of thing happening. I find that disturbing. And, you know, Congress in general, I mean, certainly the House of Representatives, probably especially the Senate and even the White House happens to be filled with people who lie about stuff all of the time. Joe Biden, really, if you're applying a George Santos uh, litmus test, he should have ended his public career around 1988 when he ran for president and blatantly plagiarized and lied about his own life story on campaign and campaign speech. Is, you know, people he's never stopped. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's, uh, you know, Dick Blumenthal repeatedly as president, Dick Blumenthal uh, misrepresented his uh, his, uh, you know, uh, uh, military service in Vietnam. Elizabeth Warren blatantly lied about being a Native American. I mean, there's a lot of fabulism that goes on. That is really it's the type of thing. If you knew that person personally, you would just not have anything to do with them anymore. So I I. You know, I don't think it's a bad thing Santos is gone, but I do think he should have been kicked out, uh, you know, by his uh, by the voters, not by a bunch of uh, people who are, you know, probably not all that different from him. And Matt, just to bring it back to the credit card thing, you know, so he steals his apparently, you know, steals, uh, you know, me other members credit cards, you know, we're on the hook for that. So, um, you know. Let's not. It wasn't some other congressman's credit card. It was America's credit card, Matt. Usually, America. And we should switch to the Discover card. Maxing out on. Yeah, you know the Discover card um, because you can keep transferring. This is maybe this is the future of budget uh, uh, responsibility. Just constantly switching the national debt to a different credit card for oh the next God. thirty America or sixty is days. going to have so many frequent flyer miles. Yeah, it's no, be it's awesome. just like okay, we just got to just remember to transfer it before that free transfer runs out. I mean, that's how I financed. My, uh, you know, my professional life in the 90s. And it worked out swell. That is I, until the Biden administration bans credit card miles. That's and, right. No, no. But you know what? Uh, Senator Delaware, you know, he he he's going to he's not going to hurt the credit card. OK, like he, he might talk a big game, but in the end, he'll fold. I'd like to uh, give myself a cookie for uh, refusing to yield the temptation of impersonating an overseas telemarketer calling America to. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, to talk about its credit card balance, I think I think that's uh, that's valuable. Uh, a couple of uh, amplifications, correctives to what Nick said. Uh, Santos is from Long Island, not upstate, uh, and uh, and also I think you left out another fabulous in American politics. Nick, his name rhymes with Ronald Bump. Yeah, uh, Peter, uh, uh, do I get another cookie also for uh, feeding a question to our friend and former Reason Roundtable? Um, uh, fill in uh, Kennedy when she was interviewing Santos about whether he was a fan of Catch Me If You Can. Matt, I'll give you as many cookies as you yeah. want, uh, as long as they are purchased from Win Dixie in a little Debbie box in 1999. Uh, All I've got for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Because that's, cause that's, I, that's, cause that's love what I love her cosmic of. brownies. Little, little Debbie that's, is yeah. a, a marvel of the modern age. There's That's no what way I lived that off of when I was a teenager, yeah, that uh, and Subway sandwiches, Doritos, a little and, Debbie. Uh, How store do they brand uh, grape soda? Nothing costs more than ninety nine cents. Like for uh, you I know guess, twelve of a little Debbie thing. It's like how, how you do, defeat inflation is you put your price yeah. on the box <laughs> rather than let the store mark it up. Either for that you. or little Debbie is. It's like that's where people who are digging out of America are like they're hiding the dirt in the tunnels they're creating and they just put it in little Debbie and get it out that way and nobody knows what they're up to. What? 
is Catherine, did they we, did they forget to give us the doses too? I, what happened? I feel mad that I got Love left what out of be. whatever is happening on Let's this. Let's get to the cream at the center yeah. of this conversation. And by I the think way, the little Debbie news. versus Dolly Madison. Come on, it's not even close. Little Debbie would slam her like Haystacks Calhoun in a like you know, in a battle royale. I am definitely world. not going to be Googling all of those words. Um, <laughs> the, the good news for all of the folks that we mentioned here, George Santos included, mm -hmm. is uh, that they have a future, I think, yeah. outside of Congress in stand-up comedy. Because per mm. Hassan Minaj, they can defend their lies and their exaggerations about That's their life true. stories as emotional truth. Well, and the memoir is going to be a banger. Yeah. I mean, I think we can all agree that the main thing that has happened here is that we are now going to get... Uh, in quite short order, the George Santos memoir, followed by a gig for him on, I don't know, maybe like Greg Gutfeld's show? Like, where does he end up? But That seems about right. I feel like yeah. we're going to, this is not the last we've seen of him and his sweaters. Maybe he's going to be the, a, the a of, vice presidential candidate for uh, uh, Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, I, Similarly also, persecuted. Yeah. going to remake the race. Yeah. The human now race. I'm excited uh, about 2024. Yeah. I, th the other thing here, though, is that that this was what he did was not politically useful to anyone. And so he was there's a lot of messy bitches at, to, to use Josh Barrow's phrase in Congress. Um, but he embodies a specific sort of uh, non usefulness, his crimes and his lies not only didn't help anyone else in his party, they didn't advance any kind of political cause. And in fact, they actively annoyed the other people in Congress because, you know, he was spending their credit card. Like Max Miller says Santos made thousands of dollars of unauthorized charges on not only the Congressman Max Miller's card, but also his mother's, apparently. Mm -hmm. Like this is this it is happens. just like, this is come on this is it's not in in many ways it is not a worst crime not the worst crime that anyone has uh, in Congress has ever done but it is different in kind and that I think also was true of Cawthorn who was an embarrassing weirdo as well and that is the thing that connects them is that they were entirely embarrassing and not in any way useful uh, to any sort of political cause at all yeah it was the use of the phrase key bumps at orgies that did in Cawthorn and nothing else probably. Um, Put that right, with speaking, little Debbie in your search thread. Click images. Hmm. We are going to pretend the first uh, segment didn't happen. Would love to do and that. And goes I agree. straight into the uh, uh, kind of early here to the uh, first of two listener emails of the week uh, in honor of our still ticking webathon. I don't know if I've mentioned that the webathon is still ongoing. Thank you also, uh, by the way, to everyone who sent yeah. in an avalanche of questions. Great questions. As well we as cash, you know. I don't know how and many of those cash. are George Santos, you know. Uh, you know Thank if you we... to Max Miller's mother yeah, Max for Miller's her donations. <laughs> Who, $50,000. Wow, that's a... So much. Uh, anyways, yeah, we did a, a bonus Ask Us Anything webisode. Uh, webisode. Episode. Webisode. <laughs> webisode. Sure. webisode. A, w a weaponized episode? Even... Is that what that is? It was all videotaped is all I know. Anyways, this question is relevant to the webathon. That's why we're asking it early in the podcast. It goes directly to Catherine... <laughs> Um, so let's go. Hi, Reasoners. It's also uh, from Anonymous. Mm. Okay. Um, hi, Reasoners. I've always wondered whether Reason gets more benefit from a donation or a subscription to the magazine. With a print magazine, the overhead of printing and mailing magazines must take a bite out of the check. On the other, uh, maybe increases in circulation numbers mean more money from advertisers, offsetting that cost and amplifying the revenue. If we want our contribution to do the most for reason, which direction should we go? Donation, print subscription, or digital? Catherine. First of all, love this question because uh, it's like a, it's like the effective altruism of the mm. webathon. Like how do we how do we buy bed nets for the reason children so that they don't get malaria? I love it. The answer to the question is First of all, what we generally say, a sort of general rubric that we use is that um, the income from our print subscriptions and print advertising roughly covers the cost of printing and mailing the magazines themselves. So that kind of zeroes out and then we still have to pay for people to produce the content and that subscription revenue dwarfs ad revenue. So um, the, the benefit of having those subscription numbers be larger isn't very substantial in terms of a revenue effect. 
the thing that I would recommend to this letter writer and to uh, anyone who is curious about how to benefit us most, particularly this very week, is that if you give us 50 bucks, you get a free digital subscription um, as one of the perks. So you can have your little Debbie and eat it too. And that way, we don't have to mail you a magazine. Uh, we get your money. And uh, you still get the contents of the magazine, which is great. That said, of course, we're super happy to have people give us their money in any form. So if you just want to get the good old fashioned print magazine, we are happy for you to do that. If you want to go digital, that's great. It can be right there on your iPad, right there on your phone, right there on your computer waiting for you. Or you can just give us cash and read everything uh, online. We do, of course, roll out every issue for free eventually on the Internet. So what you are paying for when you subscribe is just uh, advanced access to our super sexy print content. So it turns out that the answer really is the effective altruism answer, which is just give people money. I mean, kind of 50 bucks gets you a digital subscription, a Twitter shout out. If you give us 100, you also get socks. Socks. That was an O. Um, uh, That's what I said. Socks. What? Oh. I know. I know. I just it, it heard it uh, sounded a little bit uh, different in my ears, okay. and I also was making a st- stupid joke. I would also uh, just add um, or uh, b- b- supplement uh, by kind of like go where your heart is. I I love uh. the print magazine because of the um, of the the illustrations and design by Joanna Andreessen, our fantastic art director, and it's just it feels different and. And uh, it's a different experience. I think we're life is too digital for me, so I'm looking for more hard copy. But other people have the exact opposite. And follow your notes. On I like to leave uh, copies of Reason Magazine uh, in truck stops, pay phones, things mm-hmm. like that, Matt. It's the old uh, leaving religious tracks, maybe going into libraries and putting issues in books that are going to be taken out. And then uh, people them will have a conversion. Of Playboy. A con- yeah. A conversion experience, not unlike the ones that were ritually uh, described at the end of every Jack T. Chick uh, uh, evangelical tract. I I like to wrap people's phones in a print copy of Reason (laughs) Magazine. (laughs) uh, Let's move on. (laughs) Too late. Uh, As foreshadowed uh, last week on our regular uh, podcast, uh, Governors Gavin Newsom of California Mm. and Ron DeSantis of Florida squared off in a Fox News debate last week. And a hot dog eating contest. But, you know, the cameras pulled away from that. Gratian crime podcast moderation Mm. and also the 2024 presidential election of which Newsom kept jabbing his opponent that neither would be on the ballot for (laughs) is probably right. Uh, Peter, what were your thoughts about uh, the performance? Well, Eric Baim watched this so that I didn't have to, but his piece about the debate or quasi debate was really very good. Um, he, he the headline was that it was a debate about covid. The uh, the subhead that the, the body uh, argument was it kind of should have been a debate about covid, but mostly it wasn't. And they were just talking over each other. And it really sounded like the opening segment of the Reason Roundtable this week. I think the the, the best point that <laughs> um, that Eric Uh, made was that when these guys were sparring over COVID specifically, Newsom, the governor of California, was trying to tar DeSantis, the governor of Florida, as the lockdown guy. And whatever else you learn from this, that tells you which side won. Right. When the the governor of California, which closed public parks outdoors for God knows how many months or even years during COVID – is saying, hey, Florida, which opened everything sooner than the vast majority of other states. I think there were some smaller, uh, lower populated states that were mo- more open than Florida. But of the big states, Florida was certainly the most open, the earliest. And when the governor of California is saying, hey, man, you were you were locking people down and that was bad. Like we that, that's just it's just very clear at this point where public sentiment is at and where pol- ambitious politicians are trying to position themselves. And I think that while the lockdowns were in many ways bad, like that's a good thing that we have that we have gotten to the other side here. And the uh, the argument now is over who can position themselves as being least lockdowny. Newsom, uh, to be clear, uh, yellow taped. Uh, California playgrounds until December of 2020. While also uh, all- himself dining inside at what? Yeah. What's the Chez Panisse? The French Chez, Laundry. Uh, no, French, the French Laundry. Laundry, right? Yeah. At Chez one Panisse, of the most Chez Panisse regular people can afford, Peter. 
Yes, at one of the most expensive restaurants in the world. Uh, Nick, this is the debate you wanted. Yeah. Did you get what you wanted? Uh, somewhat. Yeah. And I, I mean, I hope they uh, turn it into a traveling roadshow. I would rather listen to these two windbags talk than, uh, you know, like Barack Obama and Bruce Springsteen on a, on a podcast. Um, it's, is that the choice? Is that what's I happened think it is in the our choice. world? Those are the Best only two scenario. choices. Yeah. You know. Like. Uh, but, um, it, uh, it, yeah, it, I, I thought it was good. I mean, Peter's right to talk about the way people think about lockdowns now is good. You know, the, the ag agenda there is like, okay, you don't lock down so much. Uh, we'll see what happens if, and when the next pandemic comes, because it'll, it'll come in a new wrapper. Right. Um, and, uh, people will be like, oh, no, this is different. And who knows where those chips may fall. Uh, but it is really important to discuss, you know, a kind of high tax, high service or high promised services state governance model versus a low tax and low, relatively low, uh, services provided, uh, system. And that's what you see in California and, uh, uh you know, and Florida. Uh, and, you know, to give him credit, Newsom was not terrible. Like there is a case to be made for California. Uh, you know, it's still the most populous state in the country. Uh, it did do well in terms of death rates for uh, for COVID and things like that. Um, I would love to see this expand to include, you know, the, the top four states that really matter in all of this. You throw in Texas and New York. Um, this is the debate that we need to be having because this is probably going to determine the future of America, you know, as a nation, as well as state. So I liked it. I enjoyed it. I would love to see it go, you know, migrate to MSNBC or to CNN or to, you know, reason or to open to debate or whoever to see how these conversations change when you, you know, when the framing changes a little bit. But definitely let's have more of this. A uh, fun fact about Barack Obama provided uh, uh, media content. I was uh, last night uh, uh, zoning out in front of my television, which is a rare occurrence for me, um, and uh, was like looking for a documentary. I just like, give me something, give me some like pretty uh, like uh, landscapes or something to look at, right? And I was zipping through Netflix and like, oh, were you behold, eating it. Little Debbie cakes? I mean, was there, uh, uh, they were laced with something? I hope in my mind, in my mind. And, uh, and, uh, lo and behold, there was, uh, apparently from, I think last year, a Netflix series where Barack Obama, Barack Obama is, uh, is, uh, showing you our, our wonderful, uh, like national parks. Um, like, okay. And he's like walking through why he is mailing it in people. Holy cow. Was this guy I tried to watch like 10 minutes of it. It is excruciatingly boring and like not done well. Anyways, uh, Catherine <laughs> save me from myself. Uh, what was your thoughts? Deep thoughts, uh, upon watching if indeed you did, which Peter didn't. And I'm not sure Nick did either. Catherine, what do you think? I have been trying to save you from yourself for years, uh, to it's no not. avail, but I will answer your question. Um, I did not watch it in real time. I did go back and watch like chunks of it. And that was the correct way to consume it. I recommend that to our uh, our listeners here because it is useful to see these guys in action just a bit. But we didn't we didn't need to swallow the whole lump. Um, the thing that I was struck by was, you know, it, it was what people predicted, but like. DeSantis had everything to lose and Newsom had nothing to lose. And so Newsom was having a great time. He's yes, just there. Yeah. He's <laughs> uh, Eric's write up used the the term rope -a dope which is uh, just a fantastic, fantastic description, both for what happened there and also a phrase we should be using at least once or twice a month on this podcast. Just, you know, the whole idea was like, what if we could make DeSantis look dumb? And um, like he can't keep himself together. And uh, congratulations. It worked. I do. Catherine, do you know where rope -dope emanates from? You know why I know? Because in Reason's write up, someone, I'm guessing one of our web editors, linked to the Wikipedia entry for <laughs> rope -dope, <laughs> And I clicked on it. So, yeah, I do. Right. Thank you, you very win. much. Um, but. Yeah. So I think, you know, as we talked about uh, in the lead up, like this is the these are the people who should be running for president. And I, I say that both with um, dismay and dismay. But like that's this is where we should be. And instead, the two crypt keepers will not even be debating at all, uh, maybe ever until we have an election a year from now. I uh, watched it, maybe not in Catherine's ideal way. 
but maybe in a more real way, Catherine, mm-hmm. uh, which is to say live and uh, while uh, tweeting, which is something I haven't done in a while. Um, and I found that uh, uh, exercise to be so profoundly depressing. Uh, I should have known going in, um, but uh, it was uh, it was kind of horrible to sit and watch because uh, I'm looking at people's uh, uh, responses to it. Newsom comes out of the gate just like trying to say that, well, actually, no, Florida, people are leaving Florida to come to California, yeah. like just completely saying things that are bonkers untrue and not responsive to the basic question, which is an interesting and correct one is, hey, why did California stop growing and in fact losing population in places like Florida and Texas are gaining? What what What's behind that? Completely non-responsive. And everybody from California, and I follow a lot of people there because I'm from there, in my feed was like, yeah, high five, Gavin Newsom. Yeah. Um, and every, every time Ron DeSantis said anything, things I agree with, things I disagree with, it was the same high five. I can't believe you don't realize that Newsom ruined Gavin Newsom's career forever today and just realize that we're in this state of being where it's impossible to listen to politicians just on ground of, are you telling the truth and was your policy the best? That is not how that was consumed at all. And I know that I should stop being naive at my advanced age, uh, but it was really, really uh, depressing. Um, There are huge, I don't think he even brought up the high-speed rail, which is a complete missed opportunity to cite the work of Bob Poole, among other people. But um, there are such uh, like glaring uh, examples and counterexamples between the two, and including, and Newsom was uh, kind of good on this, hitting DeSantis for his approaches towards abortion uh, bans up to just six weeks, which is uh, is almost certainly a non-starter on the federal level in addition to being a bad idea. But um, just like comparative governance issues, uh, it wasn't about that, uh, especially from the perspective of Newsom and the people who uh, have been mistreated under his rule were like, high five, I would vote for him 60 percent all over again. And uh, it makes me think that we're kind of in this uh, extended moment of political idiocy, even when two people who are actually doing governance um, love them or hate them. Um, when you're a governor of a state or mayor of a city or the executor of a county or whatever, you have to do some stuff or stuff gets done around you. And uh, and that's where a lot more tangible and different politics go as opposed to national politics, which are mostly kind of a charade um, that lead to a December cromnibus, which I'm sure we're going to be talking about any uh, any uh, week now. Um, so, yeah, I was found it horrible to uh, to kind of amplify what you're saying is uh, look at the kind of legacy media institutions or voices that were following this. Um, I read an article in The Atlantic by Ronald Brownstein, the longtime L.A. Times political correspondent who's now at The Atlantic and has been based in you know, Chevy Chase, Maryland, or thereabouts for, you know, a thousand years. And the way he wrote up the discussion was so implicitly and explicitly pro Newsom. You see what Newsom was doing and what your, you know, the the California stands were doing in Twitter is going to be amplified for a while longer. I also watched a couple of uh, segments on CNN and on NBC uh, where it was coming from that perspective. So it's going to take a while to peel that back. By the same token, DeSantis, you know, it it will be interesting to look at how much of his inability to convey or, or even kind of um, defend, much less promote his vision of governance to people who don't already agree with him. You know, he is incapable of doing that. And does that reflect something about the agenda or is it just that, you know, the idea of having, uh, you know, lower taxes and lower regulations and lower promises of services to people like where you spend less um, on things? Does it need a, a very different spokesman or is it just something that is not ever going to be really explicitly popular, even if people vote for it by moving to places like Texas and Florida? So I don't know the answer in terms of popularity, uh, national popularity anyway, but I would say that if you go back and you look at the interview you did, Nick, Mm. with Jeb Bush, Jeb Bush did a much better job of defending the idea of Florida, both as a culture, but also as a polity, as a kind of idea about how governance should be conducted than Ron DeSantis has typically done. And so it is, at least to some extent, 
a Ron DeSantis specific problem, not necessarily a problem yeah. with what Florida is. Although doing. Bush is also not in office, so he can yes, talk about things separately. It, and makes it easier in he, some ways. Also, he was, he, he's just a pretty good communicator. Yeah, yeah. Not, not the greatest, but he's reasonably good yeah. at it. And I think, frankly, Ron DeSantis has proven on the campaign trail over the past uh, better part of a year that he is not a great communicator, at least outside of the state of Florida, yeah. uh, when he's trying to talk to voters at, a, at, at, at the national level. And even in Florida, let's remember his first race for governor, Florida is uh, was uh, a swing state. He's helped kind of make it a more Republican state through his governance. Mm -hmm. But his first election, he ran against one of the weakest <laughs> Democrats possible and beat him by like 11 votes. It was incredibly razor thin. So I think he can run on his competence, mm -hmm. which I think he has a lot of, and his kind of record and uh, and how he handles disasters. People love that. And that makes sense to people who've experienced it. But as someone who has to appeal, as Nick was saying, to outsider, I found myself watching the debate and thinking, gosh, you know, sure would be great if Nikki Haley was defending Ron DeSantis's <laughs> record. <laughs> she would just do a better job of it and would fillet uh, uh, Newsom a little bit more convincingly about his own bad record. Sorry to step on you, Nick. No, no. I, I really, uh, I, I was just going to bring up Jeb Bush was a big promoter in, in the interview I did with him. And the, the long firm version is up on YouTube and, uh, and as a podcast, but he really was a big fan of Rick Scott's governorship of Florida, which was interesting to me because, you know, there, Florida has had for, you know, at least going back to the early 70s, a series of Democratic and Republican governors who all followed kind of the same script of saying, you know, we're going to keep taxes low, regulations low, we're going to welcome a lot of people and we're going to let it go. They have managed to build up you know, they're the University of Florida system as well as Florida State, et cetera. Like they have a great higher education system, which on a certain level is more accessible and it's a lot cheaper than the UC system in California. So you see like, oh, Florida is kind of like a dumb, dumb state, but they're building out, you know, a really strong kind of educational infrastructure. K through 12 is fantastic and things like that. But They've all been following the same script in a way that Texas also under Democrats or Republicans. So, you know, what might be the most interesting thing to look at over time is how these models of governance do not necessarily adhere to one party or the other, but rather to different, you know, maybe it's the youthfulness of these regions as they're developing, et cetera, and what keeps them con relatively consistent over time. Because, you know, obviously nobody on this, you know, in this conversation gives a shit about the Republicans or Democrats per se. And then it's a question of how do you, you know, how do you get to a place where people are like, yeah, you know what, we would rather not have an income tax and we would rather not have the state promise us all manner of bullshit that they're not going to be able to deliver on anyway. All right. We're going to get to a second listener email of the week here in a moment. But first, a reminder that this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Friends, the holiday season can, though it doesn't have to be, a grueling, can be a grueling gauntlet through the potential landmines of loneliness, family dynamics, and your own ability to make the right choices in a temptation-rich environment. Often, we know darn well the right path for making it through to January, safe and sane, but sometimes we can be our own worst enemy. Therapy can help you see through the blizzard of distractions and stimuli, and make it easier for you to make better decisions during what should be a joyous time. That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. BetterHelp is an easy-to-use, super flexible, entirely online therapy service that has helped many listeners of this podcast better use their own internal operating system so that holiday challenges are fun instead of torture. All you have to do is fill out a quick questionnaire, get matched with a therapist, and if you don't like the first one, just swap them out for a second. Let therapy help you make better choices. With BetterHelp, just visit BetterHelp.com slash roundtable right now to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. Okay, reminder to please email your short queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one is winningly short and also is going to lead to a winningly long set of answers, probably, I'm guessing. This is from Ben. Hello, all. How should someone feel about the death of Henry Kissinger? <laughs> Relief. Nick? <laughs> yeah. 
Why should we be relieved that a hundred year old man died, Nicholas? Uh, Henry Kissinger, I think, in, and I'm not trying to be glib here, although it probably will come off that way. He exemplifies what is wrong about American uh, foreign policy, as well as the way that we define who is an elite and an expert and good at something. He has always had a uh, you know, a thin resume uh, when he became, you know, when he moved up into the highest echelons of American policymaking, he had a series of, uh, you know, interventions or whatever you want to call it, all of which turned out unbelievably poorly. He was unapologetic for them and for his mistakes and the way that history again and again showed that he was wrong and that he was implicated in the unnecessary uh, slaughter of millions of people. And yet he was there at Studio 54 and he was there in every <laughs> White House. No, I mean, it's just like there was a celebrity, uh, you know, kind of elite complex that kept this guy, despite an unblemished record of, of basically failure, but talking the right way, coming from the right schools and staying in, you know, in the elite, uh, you know, Olympus clouds of power forever. Um, it's it's a shame, you know, it, and, and it reflects poorly on our country that he was such an influential person for so long. I think it's good that he's dead. And I hope that we don't simply bury him, but that we actually learn from what he did wrong. And we we examine deeply how America can affect positive change in the world without becoming, you know, a handmaid, if not the actual uh, creator of mass chaos, instability and death. Peter, you've long um, uh, bemoaned, lamented that uh, there hasn't been a kind of uh, intellectual counterweight of foreign policy kind of, um, uh, you know, skeptic skepticism about uh, American intervention in Washington, D.C. Kissinger seems like the absolute counterweight to what you're talking about. What What's your explanation for why he just loomed large forever? Well, he was an incredible force of personality. And if you read the friend uh, obituaries uh, that, for example, the uh, Wall Street Journal published one uh, by uh, a relatively young guy who worked for him and then also another one by Joe Lieberman, of all people. Yeah. Catherine's face. I really wish we had video this week so you could see Vinegar. Catherine's Joe. eye roll when I said the words Just, Joe Lieberman. He, every single thing he touches is... And it starts that the Joe Lieberman obit starts with him talking about how he loved to hang out with Henry Kissinger and John McCain. Who? And that's actually, I mean, that would be fun. Like that, right? It'd be pretty weird, honestly. Two dead guys and Joe Lieberman. Uh, <laughs> who's who's who? Yeah. <laughs> McCain was a good time. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna admit. Uh, I'm not gonna admit Vinegar Joe uh, or or the doctor. But I think the the Joe Lieberman, John McCain, Henry Kissinger axis of we're buddies and also we make all the big decisions for America for forty or fifty years maybe wasn't great. And it's uh, you know it exemplifies um it, it is a it, it tells you something about the the state of the country now and the and also sort of i mean how we got into the mess that we are in and how we have gotten it how we have uh, why why a lot of american foreign policy looks the way it does and has looked the way it has since the 1960s Catherine, you were a baby neocon or at least you were a baby with neocons uh, mm -hmm. kissinger was not kissinger was a realist a lot of neocons hated him do you have memories of the uh, the role of Kissinger in that milieu, and if not, uh, what other things do you have to say? So Christian Britschke basically makes this point um, in the piece that he wrote for Reason dot com after after Kissinger's death um, that uh, there are worse things than realism, and that actually a highly ideologically motivated interventionist foreign policy is in many ways going to get you worse results, even than the much vilified Kissinger approach. Not that we shouldn't vilify Kissinger's approach because it deserves it. Uh, I actually wanted to share, though, I have like a management lesson from Kissinger that I think yeah. about a lot. And that is uh, that I have no idea if this story is true, but it seems true-ish. Um, the idea that he uh, once gave a speechwriter an assignment. Uh, the speechwriter writes the speech, <clears throat> comes back and says, here you go. Kissinger keeps it for a day and then says, 
you know, would you would you say this is your best work? And the speechwriter's like, oh, no, you're right. I could do better. I'm sorry. I was in a rush. Takes the speech back, rewrites it, returns it. Kissinger has it for, for a day, returns it and says, are you sure this is your best work? And, no, no, you're right. I could have done better. Finally, the speechwriter storms back in, slams a paper on the desk, says, sir, this is the finest speech that has ever been written. And Kissinger says, OK, then I'll read it. Uh, and uh. I don't <laughs> do that. I wouldn't do that. But yeah, you definitely have never done that. Sometimes when people file to me and they're like, I wrote this draft. I think it's bad. Let me know what you think. I just write them back and say, why don't you work on it till it's good? And when I do that, I think of Henry Kissinger. So thanks, dude, for that. And my uh, various freelancers and uh, colleagues. This maybe. is the no, thanks. remove all the brown M&Ms story, but like for managing writers. Right. It's a little just... bit. Yeah. I mean, it's just like sometimes when people are like clearly know they didn't give you your be their best work and you got a little time, like, give me your best work. I think that's a good lesson. And I wish uh, that somebody had done that to, to Kissinger with uh, what happened in, you know, <laughs> Cambodia, as far as I can tell. Uh, you know, what's what's interesting to uh, kind of think about is that Kissinger is not, uh, you know, and Catherine was suggesting this, uh, I think, uh, you know, he's not the limit of realism. And it's not the choices in between idiot kind of neocon intervention, as we saw in the early parts of this century, um, or realism, as it was defined, defined by Kissinger in the in the 70s, um, and, and continue to have some reverberations after that. There is a libertarian realism uh, and a non-interventionist realism that is that has been being sketched out sometimes in the pages of reason. Uh, at other places like the Quincy Institute and whatnot, which is not isolationism uh, and is not, you know, uh, military forced interventions. And we will we will do better as a country with foreign policy when we start to kind of steer between, you know, what Kissinger represents and then what a lot of his critics on the right, uh, Matt, many of whom you talked with a lot on uh, things like the independence and stuff like that, you know, this is you know this is the place where we need to be driving and um for that reason again it's important to remember what kissinger's legacy was not you know not the party pictures from vanity fair and i i find it deeply disturbing the way that his you know in the end like does katie couric give a shit about foreign policy no she just knows henry kissinger is really important and he's always like in the upper five of like time's most you know, fabulous people of the, you know, last hundred years or something. And like, we really need to uh, decouple the the system that produced him both in entertainment as well as in um, ideology and kind of, and really move on from that. I think that um, Kissinger style realism is not, uh, and shouldn't be at least, the style of realism that is being explored by various people in the contemporary scene in a couple of ways. Um, a big one is just that this, you know, he was in the middle of it, in the middle of the Cold War. The Cold War was a dirty war, or I should say it was a bunch, scores and scores of dirty proxy wars all over the globe, um, of which many uh, bad, bad things happened. Uh, really, uh, some just vicious calculations were being constantly made. Um, the Soviet Union was pouring tons and tons of energy and people, and so it was Cuba and other places. Uh, in it, and the U.S. was on the other side, and just awful things happened. One of the best things that happened ever in the world with the end of the Cold War was at the end of all these proxy wars suddenly, and peace broke out all over the place because no longer did both of those sides feel like they had the time, energy, or inclination to keep uh, fluffing up these wars. Um, and so part of the revulsion against Kissinger is revulsion against that history, which was messy and uh, and which no one feels great about. And they argued about vociferously at the time. And then key element of that, and one of the reasons I think that makes Kissinger a unique hate figure, uh, besides the fact that he was right there in the middle of the Vietnam War, which is, uh, which is memorialized by people who are of that age at the time. Um, but uh, a big part of it was just the Nixon tapes, dude. Uh, just if you hear him 
uh, talking with Nixon, the way they talked about other human beings on the planet, sometimes people who are being slaughtered or might be slaughtered or um, there are various, you know, uh, whether Indian women are hot or not, that kind of stuff. It was grotesque. Some of just awful, awful treatment of your fellow human beings that would seem unthinkable uh, uh, in a contemporary context, no matter how much you hate individually or hate the policies of a George W. Bush or Dick Cheney or Barack Obama or Bill Clinton. You can't imagine those types of conversations happening in the White House that we have plenty of audio from in the Nixon White House. There was something so arrogant, um, condescending, very often racist about the way that they talked about things that that combined with the actual dirty wars everywhere, the hundreds of thousands, the millions of people who were killed or maimed and otherwise affected by this um, made him a unique hate figure. And I think th I have a, at least a small amount of of sympathy or empathy uh, uh, with the take that I'm seeing around uh, a, a few places that it's easy for everyone just to decide that Kissinger was our unique foreign policy villain. And then we sort of wipe our hands clean and everything's fine. It's not uh, fine. Um, uh, there are, were throughout the Cold War and afterwards, there is blood on a whole bunch of different hands and uh, people uh, have been wrong, um, including I'm sure every single person on this podcast about various things in foreign policy over the years. And people should treat it with humility and that humility should also uh, inform uh, your sense of what is proper for the United States and its military to do. Uh, over the years. So I think that uh, I understand um, people's revulsion toward him, and I hope that doesn't limit uh, their uh, exploration and examination. And I hope that they and all of us resist the temptation to make realism a new amorality where you start um, just because you know the US uh, might be or American public, might be sympathetic to one side as opposed to another in a particular conflict, that doesn't mean you amorally have to take the side of the other people. And you do see that a lot, um, not just on college campuses, but elsewhere. And that's not the type of realism. It's not realistic. It's not right. Um, uh, and it's you should be able to connect with your sense of morality and rightness, uh, regardless of what you think that the tip of the American spear should do. Uh, and that's the end of that rant and sorry for it. So uh, let's get to our end of podcast, what we have been uh, consuming. Thanks for that question, by the way. Um, and uh, in the cultural arena, Peter, why don't you start us off? I saw Silent Night. It's the new John Woo movie. John Woo, of course, being the famed Hong Kong action director behind movies like Hard Boiled and The Killer, as well as some great Hollywood 90s action movies like Face Off and Hard Target. And in some ways, it is a pretty straightforward movie about a guy who gets his throat blown out and then goes on a silent murder spree. Right. Can't talk. There is essentially no dialogue in this movie. And so he spends like the first, I don't know, hour or so basically doing pull ups and watching fight videos on YouTube, going crazier and crazier and crazier. And then the last 40 minutes of the movie, just like murdering a huge number of gang thugs, uh, sort of like uh, cartel types operating on this side of the border uh, in uh, some place in Texas. But it is also. Something more than just a, a, a sort of straightforward, slightly high concept action movie. It is also the most reactionary kind of anti Biden's America film I think I have seen in the last couple of years. And the, the best way to capture that is that at the beginning of the movie, he not only gets his throat blown out, you also uh, re, uh, see via some flashbacks that his that his son has been killed by these same gang members having a shootout in his neighborhood. And so he goes to the hospital and uh, he comes back. And as he is coming back from the hospital, he is experiencing pandemic America and his suburb has been trashed and he is he is like riding through his suburb and it's dirty and it's gross and there's uh, you know there's just um, graffiti on all of the walls and there's drug deals happening on every corner and it's all just like gang members selling stuff to kids and as this is happening there's no dialogue uh, conventional dialogue in the movie but you do occasionally hear snippets on the radio and on the radio they're explaining inflation 
And they're just like explicitly saying, well, inflation is because they, we spent a bunch of money during the pandemic and there were all these checks that got sent out and they created excess demand and now everything's expensive. And so it is quite explicitly pairing the disorder and the crime and the sense of everything being wrong in 2021 America with all of the inflation stuff and with Joe Biden's policies. And so out of that, you get Joel Kinnaman becoming like an absolutely rage filled madman where he comes back to his house at the end of 2021 and then writes on his calendar. He flips up to December 24th. Uh, 2022, and it just writes the words, kill them all. And then that's the movie from there. But it's it's a I mean, it's not a great movie. There's some good action uh, sequences at the end, but it is a kind of interesting reflection on our culture right now and on the kind of dissatisfaction with uh, urban disorder and the state of American politics. I wonder, uh, is there an advent calendar in that? That would be kind of neat. Christmas movies. Uh, Catherine, you'll have you to watch it to? to find out. I don't want to do spoilers here. Uh, Actually, no, Nick, why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, continue? And, uh, okay. You can so I uh, 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 read uh, The Heart of a Cheetah by Magat Wade, who uh, works for the Atlas Network. Uh, she runs their Africa programs. Uh, she is a, uh, a um, entrepreneur. Uh, from Senegal, and uh, this is a memoir as well as a kind of exploration of African consciousness uh, and from a market-friendly uh, perspective. Uh, she's very indebted to the uh, late, great sociologist George Aidi, Aidi of uh, American University, who I believe uh, appeared at various points in the pages of Reason, but Heart of a Cheetah is uh, subtitled How We Have Been Lied To About African Poverty and What That Means for Human Flourishing. If you are interested in post-colonial understandings of the developing world, this book is fascinating because she uh, really explores the way in which Africa writ large, and par particularly what used to be called Black Africa, has taken on a massive inferiority complex that came from uh, generations of colonial uh, rule as well as the uh, cultural superstructure that comes along with that and how various people try to respond to that. And we've seen, you know, at various points, we've seen an explora exploration of that mostly from a hard left, uh, either Marxist or, or kind of progressive mindset. And the way to fix it is through aid and through kind of reparations, either uh, literal or figurative, being made by the West, uh, by the or the countries that colonized Africa. She comes at it from a different perspective, which is uh, very fascinating uh, to hear her talk about how difficult it is to start businesses in Africa and how that's changing. And then interwoven with her personal story, where she started a couple of uh, companies herself. Uh, as well as working with the Atlas Network. It's a fantastic read about uh, the continent, which by her count, it's something like in 2050, something like a 25% of the world's population is going to be in Africa. Um, so this is, you know, this is the continent that is rising in a massive way. And understanding uh, both where it is and where it might go is just endlessly interesting to me uh the heart of a cheetah by magat wade who i'll also be interviewing for a uh reason interview podcast coming up over the next couple of weeks awesome Catherine, what did you consume so mine actually ties together many of the themes of this podcast in a way that i very much did not expect uh i want to recommend an essay in the journal Antigone, um, which is a newish classics journal, it's just like an online journal, um, maybe only about two years old. I came across this essay uh, in a tweet by Susan Crystal, uh, the lovely wife of Bill Crystal, who uh, does good tweets, actually. And um, it's by Stephen Pimentel. And it's basically about um, the story of Circe in, in the Odyssey. Uh, as an exploration of like uh, hallucinogenic drugs and shamanism versus the idea of medicine. So uh, the, you know, Odysseus sends his men. Uh, Circe gives them barley and cheese and pale honey added to Primanian wine, which I think is the Greek equivalent of Little Debbie snack cakes. Um, <laughs> and she <laughs> laces them with malignant drugs. There's then this like very interesting discussion of like, 
So they become pigs, but do they do they think they're pigs or do their bodies turn into pigs? We don't know. Um, uh, there's a cool kind of uh, historical exploration of what drugs these might have been. Hermes gives Odysseus some medicine to prevent being impacted by these drugs. He sort of saves the day, but sort of not because it's Odysseus. It's a really good essay in this journal that just seems to exist because, I don't know, sometimes you just want to start an online journal. I know nothing about the context of this. So there could be some classicist out there that's like, no, this is the one for the Nazis. I don't know. I don't think so, though. The essays seem pretty good. And in the manifesto for the journal, uh, it notes that um, Antigone, who, of course, um, you know, defies a uh, the prohibition of a tyrant and goes to bury her fallen brother, uh, is a powerful symbol of independent mindedness and resistance. And so my closing thought is, do we need to be um, adopting Antigone as a kind of uh, libertarian symbol? Maybe yes. in the future. Yes. Those yes. Are, and those thunder. are my thoughts. She, Antigone, okay. the play is great. The character is great. Uh, or, you know, uh, Sophocles' version. Yes, very much so. She's at the the heart of like higher law. Uh, kind of traditions. Uh, yep. She's a, she's a great proto libertarian or individualist. Wonderful. So spend some also, more time with uh, hallucinogenic drugs and also more time with Antigone is my thought for you this holiday and webathon season. I'm just disappointed also, that this wasn't a recommendation for zebra cakes. Yeah. No, those no are zebra good. cakes here. Those are uh, good. But, uh, but yeah, if you want some, some barley and honeyed wine, we, we got you covered. <laughs> craving a nutty buddy. <laughs> So uh, last week, uh, the uh, lead singer of the uh, Pogues, the Irish mm. punk band, folk punk band, Shane McGowan, uh, died at age 65. He was going on 100. Uh, his liver was 5,000 <laughs> years old, I believe, um, or his second liver or third liver. Uh, it's amazing that he lived that long. Uh, but I use it as an, ex as an occasion to dip back into a record um, that was just astonishing to me when it came out. Um, and I hadn't listened to in the last 20 years because you kind of don't need to if you live in New York. <laughs> You're going to hear some Pogues uh, songs. It's their uh, 1985 record called Rum, Sodomy, and the Lash, which is a, definitely a top 10 uh, album title name. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm here to tell you, um, if you don't know anything about the Pogues, if you do know anything about the Pogues, give it uh, another listen. Um, it is It retains its uh, capacity to absolutely... Uh, astonish. He's the lead singer, main songwriter. Um, his teeth are incredible uh, works of of uh, of, <laughs> of uh, Stonehenge uh, style art, um, or were at least until they got replaced. But the uh, the record itself, which I stupidly only found out uh, just by Wikipediaing it for the first time in my life uh, the other day, uh, was produced by Elvis Costello, uh, strangely enough. But it's this, uh, it is Irish folk music and punk rock and screaming uh, and these incredibly uh, moving, uh, bleak as hell uh, ballads. Um, uh, Old Main Drag is just one of uh, the like a top five song for me of along with like, you know, I'm waiting for my man or something from the velvet underground of like, my God, you can write a song about this. Um, I uh, just, uh, there's nothing like it in the world and there's nothing like Shane McGowan's delivery of these really, uh, amazing, uh, lyrics, uh, from these things. Rum, Sodom and Lash. It's an incredible record. And unlike almost any other like revered, kind of punk alternative record from the mid 1980s does not suffer from mid 1980s lousy production values. Um, uh, doesn't have the horrible gated snare. It doesn't have all these kind of bad things. Uh, it is, uh, you know, if you've heard fairy tale of New York and that's why you don't need to listen to the pokes ever again. Uh, if you live in New York city, cause you're going to hear that over and over again. Um, uh, this I will take, you know, uh, and the band played waltzing Matilda, which is one of the best anti-war songs ever, uh, written or uh, covered in this case, um, I'll take all of those uh, any day. It is just an astonishing document. So check it out, Rum Sodomy and Lash. Trust me uh, on it. And uh, but you know, cover your child's ears. It's got some pretty uh, pretty grim content on there. Um, uh, but we have uh, friendlier content here at Reason dot uh, com throughout this uh, beautiful webathon. But before we talk about the webathon, uh, uh, what's your name, Nick? Uh, why don't you tell us about any events that you would like to uh, hype uh, here in New York City? 
Yeah, I want to hype the uh, uh, December 12th uh, live Reason interview taping. We call them the Reason Speakeasy, and we're going to be talking with Jennifer Burns, author of the masterful, definitive new biography of Milton Friedman uh, that is called The Last Conservative, which is obviously a bad title for a book about a libertarian economist. We'll get into that uh, at some point, but there's uh, beer, wine, soda, and food. Tickets are $10. Go to reason.com slash events to uh, get yours now. They are going like Little Debbie zebra cakes or cosmic brownies. So by the time you listen to this, there will be 30 hours or less in our uh, annual Webathon fundraising drive. Uh, you can learn more about it by just going to reason.com slash donate. Catherine, is there something you want to tell the kids? We've raised about a half a million dollars already, which is fantastic. It's, I think, our fourth uh, best webathon to date. We have a chance to be third, second, or even first. Um, target is now up to 600,000. We, we, uh, maxed out our initial target of 400,000, but Catherine, uh, give us a last closing pitch to the reason webathon. Yes, you should. If you are the kind of person who makes it all the way to the end of the reason round table, probably give us some money because these podcasts do take time, energy, resources, et cetera, to produce, as does everything else we do, our videos, our podcasts, our magazine, our website, our Instagrams, our YouTube shorts, our TikToks, our tweets, our Facebook posts. We do a lot of stuff. We are everywhere you want to be. Um, you should follow us. And uh, of course, if you do not have cash money on hand, that is fine. We would love it if you just promoted this webathon or even just shared our articles because that helps us out as well. Um, if you, like our letter writer from earlier in the show, would like to get uh, some of the juicy, juicy content from Reason Magazine and aren't sure about the best way to do that, consider a $50 donation, which gets you a digital subscription. Um, or uh, if you give at higher levels, you can get socks, you can get a hat, you can get a mug, you can get invitations to uh, lunches and conferences and Zooms and all kinds of fun stuff, uh, including a Zoom with these here folks on this podcast, a private party if you will, the VIP room of the round table. Um, the Studio 54 way, of Libertarianism. Yes, it will be just like when John McCain, Joe Lieberman, and Henry <laughs> Kissinger yeah. hang out. <laughs> Except for and not George evil. Santos got together. And George Santos Did will be there. Just, um, <laughs> it'll be just like that, except for not evil. So um, if you have already given, thank you so much. If you have not given yet, consider doing so this week because we have a matching grant. So you can double your dollars. Thanks, dudes. Thank you, everyone, and we'll catch you next week. Goodbye.